Okay, not gonna step on racks because I heard that there are those scorpions underneath them. We're out here in these Arizona nights. It's like 90 degrees, which is honestly perfect. I'm I'm just loving it here, guys. I'm sorry to break it to you, but uh, but it's true. Okay, it is recording. Okay, here we go. I'm Nora McInerney, and this is Terrible Thanks for Asking, and I swear to goodness, if I ever describe grief as a journey, you can kick me in the ankle. The ankle is an incredibly sensitive body part. I recently walked into a table, somehow hit only my ankle bone. That was true pain, but it's so tempting to call grief a journey. I mean, you go places, dark places mainly, and then when you're feeling up to it, you go to therapy or maybe to the bank, maybe the grocery store, looking like trash and feeling worse, but at least you're out of the house. Journeys, however, have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and grief has a beginning and a middle, and then it never ends. It just stops being the compass by which you steer your life. This episode, though, it is a journey. This is David. David met his wife, Katie, in high school, which, who does that? Dozens of people, apparently. Katie and David were both high school kids who liked cars, which, to me, there's cars, trucks, vans, end of list. That's what cars are to me, but not for David and Katie. They are car people. They're car nerds. Katie and I have always liked cars. We both drive, we both, you know, drove stick shift cars back in high school. She had a, uh, I want to say 96, maybe 94 Acura Integra. They called it the Black Acura because it was black. And we just, we just love cars. And I think I had had a 2006 Mazda RX-8, which is this weird little sports car. I've, I've always had sort of a, a soft spot for unknown weird cars. Like I, I've never wanted a Corvette or a you know or a Mustang or or anything like that. They've just always seemed, I don't know, too common. So David had been in love with Katie since they were 17, but they were on and off again in college. David went to school in Houston, Katie went to school in Steubenville, Ohio, and they'd visit back and forth. They'd break up, and they'd get back together. Kyle picked me up from the airport. He's like, David, this is a bad idea. <laughs> you literally have the 45 minutes from the airport to campus to convince me that this is a good idea, or I'm going to turn right back around <laughs> and take you right back to the airport. And somehow I, I convinced him, and then, you know, I... I found like a quiet place on campus and I wrote her this letter and I found some, you know, we went and I got some flowers and I went to her dorm and I like, you know, tried to find her and she had left campus for the weekend. But it all works out eventually. After graduation, Katie and David are engaged and before they're officially married, they go through a premarital counseling with their pastor. Premarital counseling is like sitting down with someone and answering a bunch of questions about your future marriage, which doesn't exist yet. He asked me, why do you want to marry Katie? I said, I, I don't know. I mean, to, to make her happy. I want, to, I want to make her happy. And he sort of jumps on us like, you know, are you going to be happy when, you know, your kid's got a broken leg and you're in the emergency room and you don't have health insurance and you're, you know, just sort of laying out this doomsday scenario. The point Father Bill wanted to make was that marriage is not about happiness and marriage is hard. And David and Katie are young and they're like, okay. So Katie and David get married and they have four children together and they have this beautiful life where they live a few blocks from Katie's parents, which is good because they have four children and they spend their free time at least two weekends a month up at Katie's parents' cabin in the Texas Hill Country. And so every day is chaos, but up there at the lake, it's at least calmer chaos because, you know, the kids have some space to run around and, you know, they can play in the water and her parents are there. So we have two extra adults to help, you know, make meals and change diapers and, you know, it, it, everything that goes along with, with, uh, 
with having four kids. And I remember sitting on the porch out there in the Adirondack chairs with, with Katie. I think her parents were inside. And I remember just thinking to myself, I think even said, said out loud to her, like, this is, this is too good. What's like, what something's got to happen. Something's like it. People don't get this lucky. People don't, don't get to have lives. This what's the word? Um, charmed. It, it's just, it's too good. Katie disagrees. If David is the one who always has to be doing something, always keeping busy, Katie is the one who can just be. Because life isn't too good. It's just life. It's good, and it's horrible, and most importantly, it is subject to change without notice. And that's what David and Katie's life does. That's what life always does, by the way. It just changes. Not because you've jinxed it, or because you haven't appreciated it enough, or because you've somehow done something to deserve it. It just changes. After their fourth child was born, Katie had some pain in her right abdomen, and she assumed, because that birth was a toughie, that she'd push too hard and had a hernia. By the time they got around to finally going to see a surgeon, the surgeon felt around and agreed, "Mm, yeah, feels like a hernia. Let's get you scheduled for a surgery. It should take about 30 minutes. No big deal. The day of the surgery, David brings Katie in. They take some silly photos together, and he settles into the waiting room for what he expects to be a half hour. And when you've got four kids a half hour alone even in a waiting room, like you could read a whole, a whole part of a magazine, not a whole magazine, but a whole part of it. It was supposed to be like a 30 minute surgery and it was an hour and an hour and a half or two hours later. I'm like, what is going on? He finally comes out and I'm sitting there in the waiting room, you know, uh, and there's other families around, like just, you know, comes out, to give an update on the surgery. And he says, you know, I, I did not find a hernia when I went in. I found a tumor uh, about the size of my fist. I've removed it and I've removed the section of, so it was, it was on her appendix, but it was also attached to her large intestines. And so I've removed that section of large intestine and then sewn the two halves back together. I'm sewing her back up and, you know, she should be out in half an hour. And I remember asking him, um, so you, you said tumor, are you worried that it's cancer? And he kind of looked at me and said, yeah, um, that, that's my concern. And there, right there, is one of those changes. Katie doesn't have a hernia. She has cancer. They aren't just a family of six. They're a family of six with cancer. The whole experience of cancer is, um, I I, I don't know how to describe it, but it feels communal, almost. Like, like you're, you're receiving that news because the news isn't just about, you know, is she going to live or die? The news is about is, are my kids going to grow up without a mother? Or am I going to be single? You know, again, uh, are her parents going to lose their daughter? You know, it, it's all those things wrapped up in this little test result, right? You know, is, is the scan clear? Um, are your numbers lower? All, all that sort of stuff. And so with, with every little test, it feels like there's just this whole cascade of implications that you've got to work through instantaneously. The surgery was in February, and for the next few months, it's just a blur of chemo and radiation and prayers and friends and family dropping off food. Katie and David have a blog to update everyone on what's happening and what it all means, and because it's America and healthcare is a privilege— and many, many people are absolutely wrecked by medical debt, a GoFundMe to help them survive financially. 
And one of the things I'd said early on was, gosh, if there's money left over after we're done with chemo and after all of this is behind us, you know, I would love to take the family on a trip. It, it would be it'd be great to take Katie and the kids somewhere where we can just, you know, get away and and you know do something like that together. That's a goal they're looking forward to. That someday this will be over. Someday it will be good again. Someday they will live outside the walls of MD Anderson Cancer Center and their own home. Oh, and if there's any money left after that family trip, David is going to find a weird, cool car he's always wanted. And please know that the words you are about to hear mean nothing to me. It's a V8, a 6.2 liter V8, six-speed transmission, and it's four doors, which, hey, I've got kids. I, I need to be able to put kids in the back practical. seat. Practical. Totally practical. It's a, it, you know, it looks like a sedan. It's totally boring, um, except that it's got a Corvette motor, you know, underneath. Uh, so, it, so yeah, the, the, the Chevy SS was made from 2012 through 2017. 17 was the last model year. It's actually produced in Australia and imported to America in very small numbers. The idea of David buying that car makes Katie laugh, but the trip, that family trip, that could happen. In the meantime, they're buoyed by their family and friends, by their faith, by the fact that they're at one of the best cancer treatment centers in the U.S. By August, Katie's treatment is done. Her scans are clear. And there's a little money left in the bank, and time once again stretches in front of them. It's time, not for David to get that cool car that he wants, but for them to hit the road and take a trip, all six of them. And we, you know, went all over Yosemite. We drove up to uh, up to the mountains, the High Sierras up there. We just had a, we had a great time. We hiked all over. And, and the kids, you know, loved every bit of it. You don't always know when you're making a memory. If we did, we'd be walking around making sure we cataloged the very best moments. The biggest ones, right down to the last detail. Instead, they sort of blend together. Some pastiche of feelings and moments and smells and song lyrics swirling together in our brains. What rises to the top aren't always those big moments, but the little ones. We were driving up through the High Sierras, so, you know, it's an additional, I don't know, 2,000 feet of elevation or something like that. Um, and it's snowing up there in October, which is an early snow. Or maybe it's left over from last year. I don't know how it works up there. Uh, but our youngest, Andrew, um, is not having it with the snow. And hes you can see the look on his face is just terror this is too cold it's uncomfortable my gloves got you know i picked up the snow and then my gloves got wet and now my hands are cold and he's just crying and katie's sort of behind him holding him uh, but just laughing at the whole scene because you know the other kids are playing in the snow and we're all having a good time and andrew's just here wailing his heart out this trip is an emotional palate cleanser it's joy and wonder and the awe of how beautiful the world is outside of our own sad experiences. And near the end, Katie isn't feeling well. Her right side hurts and Katie and David both want to believe that it's just surgical pain. But once they're back from that trip, back at their doctor's office. A different radiologist looked at it and said they missed it. It was sort of hidden back here, and that the tumor came back, and it's spreading, and there's more of it. And you look at the trajectory from the surgery back in February to today, seven, eight months later, it's pretty fast growing. Time for a break.
we're back. Katie and David are at the doctor getting some very bad news about Katie's cancer. It just didn't work. None of it. The chemo, the radiation, the surgery, the prayers, the potlucks. You know, they actually missed a tumor and it was, she had been growing cancer the whole time and the the chemo had never worked. And um, so after we learned all of that, we realized that, man, that trip was, was the best thing we could have possibly done for these kids. The celebratory trip meant to mark the start of their new life was not that. It was more of a goodbye trip. There's pain and beauty in the long goodbye. Katie pours her energy in those last months into designing new landscaping in the front yard, adding plants and trees and pathways, art directing beauty that she will never get to enjoy herself, supervising the work from her seat on the couch. David talks to her about death and faith and other important things like that car he mentioned earlier. And this time it's not a joke. It's more like an idea, not for right now, but for after Katie dies. I've got this idea, like, I think I'm going to buy one of these and like take a trip and, and, and get away for a little while. And I remember that, that specific night when I asked her that it was, um, it was towards the end, probably two, maybe three weeks before she died. You know, she was in a different space. This wasn't a joke. And, and, and she just looked at me and said, David, I, I can't tell you whether you should do that or not. You've got to figure that out. That's, you've got to, you know, this, and it, and it was, it was one of those moments where, you know, we were just very real with each other where, you know, we we're acknowledging that she's not going to be there to make all those decisions. She's not going to be there to figure out what school should the kids go to? Um, you know, should we, should we move from this house or not? How do we raise the kids in the midst of whatever happens? Those are going to be mine to figure out and she won't be able to help me. Like that answer was, was sort of packed with a lot of meaning, you know, not just, eh, whatever you do, whatever you want with what you drive. It was, you're going to have the responsibility of figuring out how to make life work in my absence. Katie died seven months after that trip to Yosemite. Now it's spring in Texas, and all the responsibility for figuring out how life works without Katie is on David. There's a funeral, of course, there are friends and family, and there's also that same idea he brought up to Katie before. So I started looking for this car and, you know, looking all around the country uh, just because you had to open your, your search up that wide in order to, to find them. Um, and I, f- I found one in Beloit, Ohio, B-E-L-O-I-T, I don't know, something like that. Um, and I remember thinking like, where is that? And I look it up and it's, you know, half an hour from Steubenville. The exact car he wants in the color he wants, orange, with the features he wants, which I won't even try to describe, is a half hour from where Katie went to college and many, many miles away from David and his children. The expectations of a grieving person are cry, take care of your obligations, cry, look sad. You are now, above all, a griever. You're not David who lost his high school sweetheart. You're not, you're not a guy who, you know, suddenly feels lost in the world without his best friend. You're not, uh, you know, your parents' son who's hurting from, you know, the worst pain that could be inflicted upon a, upon a person. You are, you are father to four children. That is, that's all that you are. And, And so I think, from the outside, if you frame grief that way, then you have certain expectations, right? That leads to expectations. So if all you are is their father, then your only responsibility is to care for them. Your only responsibility is to 
to be what they need or to fill their juice boxes or to change diapers. And I feel like there's a, there's a real risk in allowing myself to be defined that way. We're expected to cross the threshold from our old life to our new life just like that, but it doesn't happen that way. There's a lot of time spent in a liminal space where you're not quite who you are, not quite where you're going. You need time to metabolize the experience of losing a person you love. To get that car, David is going to take a break from being a dad. He's going to need a bit of an on-ramp to this new life. And he's going to take a road trip. The plan is this. He'll fly out to the car, meet his friend Kyle, who's known Katie and David since high school, and the two of them will drive the car home. How long will it take? As long as it takes. How do you select your road trip partner? <laughs> uh, my choices were were limited uh, by who would want to do a trip like that, um, who can drive a stick shift, and uh, and who could get the time off. Um, so so really, uh, I mean, I don't want to make it sound like I, don't, I, I certainly don't want Kyle, Kyle to listen to this and be like, "Well, he just sort of landed on me as a last resort." No, like uh, I mean, Kyle, honestly, it was you were available. Okay. <laughs> Steubenville is a funny word to say, Steubenville. And it's also the place where Katie spent a lot of time becoming the person that David would marry. There's a certain kind of magic that exists in places where our loved ones lived the other versions of themselves, where the other parts of their life unfolded. Katie isn't in Steubenville, but she is. Those other Katies are there. It was a place that that meant a lot to to Katie. It was a you know that community and that school meant a lot to her, and and it was a place that meant a lot to me too. So it was we had a lot of sort of pivotal moments there, and so it was almost like a pilgrimage, right? To go back and to um, to pray in the places where we prayed, and to you know walk the paths that we'd walked. While David's in Steubenville, he stays with a friend's parents. People who know what he's been through, who are sad for him and for Katie and their family, but have a different sadness than the one at home. Here, he finds that his host is also a widower, that his host's first wife died of cancer, that he too nursed his loved one until the end. Like he got it in a way that no no one had spoken to until then got it. It was that first moment of that first kind of glimpse into what life could be after losing your wife. And so that was, that was really good. It was, it was good to get away and sort of not just be in a new space, but to get away from, I think everyone's expectations of how you're supposed to be or how you're supposed to grieve. But I think in a large part for me, at least it was my projecting what other people expected of me. So I would I would think that, well, this is how people see me, and so this is what they expect of me. And then I would I would judge myself based on that. As opposed to I'm I'm sure that my own perception of of how other people saw me and what they expected of me differed greatly from what they would actually say or what they actually felt. That's what this road trip is. It's a way for David to free himself of any projections or expectations to just let the experience of grief be whatever it is. David picks Kyle up from the airport and off they go. And so like we're, we're almost immediately in the mountains or in, in the hills. Um, and it's just, you know, we've got the windows down. It's I don't know, in the fifties outside and it smells incredible. Um, and we're just, it's just almost, you know, there's, it's one of those things about driving. I feel like is that, you know, you've got the road in front of you and you've got, um, and then what's, what's behind is like, you don't have to worry about it. You're, you've passed that. And so all you, all you're worried about, especially in a car like that, you know, with 400 horsepower under your right foot, 
you're focused on what's next. You're focused on, you know, is there a turn up ahead? Do I need to be speeding up or slowing down? Do I need to watch out for cops? It, there was just something kind of, I don't know, zen. Can 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 I say that? <laughs> There's a deeply philosophical quote from Dom Toretto, a character played by Vin Diesel in the Fast and Furious movie franchise, which is a franchise worth getting deeply invested in. Dom says, and I quote, I live my life a quarter mile at a time. And yeah, you want to laugh at that because he's talking about street racing, but he's also talking about life. And truly, when David was talking I did think about Dom Toretto and this iconic line because there's something to that, to only living what is right in front of you, what is right now. And while David's body and reflexes are focused on the right now, his brain can cycle through all the thoughts that are just too hot to touch when you're in the thick of your loved one's suffering and the aftermath of their death. I feel like there's so much that goes on in your head when you're trying to process a grief like that, that like it almost gets, I don't know, like all your thoughts and all your grief and all your frustration and anxiety, it all can get jumbled up and not, you know, like you can't process any of it because it's all there at the same time. And so the driving you know, it's kind of like taking a shower, right? Is where where you, you know, for that moment, your your brain sort of unfreezes and is able to take one thing and process it and leave the rest away because, you know, the only space that's left after the involvement of driving that car is just enough to process one thing. And so you can kind of think about that while you're driving. And, you know, if you need to talk about it a little bit, I've got Kyle there to talk about it. And if you just need to be silent and think to yourself for a while, then then do that too. It's almost one of those things where like you need to reduce the processing power that you can allocate to the grief in order to properly work through it. David's brain has time on these long drives, his best friend quietly sitting beside him to truly absorb what he lost when Katie died. The lives they thought they would have together, which were never promised, but were at least possible while she was alive. Because the two of them had been together for most of their lives. David, in his words, has been obsessed with Katie since age 15. They had a lot of time together, but not nearly as much as they'd expected to have. And losing her was not just losing the Katie he knew, but the Katie's he planned to know for the rest of his life. It's not even a possibility to to do the things that we had planned to do and to take the trips and to, you know, buy the house and whatever it was that we had planned for some indeterminate time in the future, that's all gone. You can't get that back. There's no replacing that per se. There's, There's something different and something new. And well, what does that mean? How am I going to be, how do I want to live moving forward? And not, like, let's be clear, there weren't a whole lot of options for me to change things, right? I mean, I wasn't going to, like, pick up and move houses. I wasn't going to, like, you know, drop a couple kids off at Goodwill. I mean, obviously, you know, I've got four kids. I've got a good job. Like, there's not a whole lot of wiggle room in the day-to-day, but I feel like there's a lot of space for like how how to go about those things, you know, how to carry Katie and and all that grief, you know, in the midst of a day-to-day that's largely, you know, set. Um, that honestly, I think here's something that people don't understand. Raising children is so tedious. (laughs) (laughs) What do 
does it mean to live something new? As he drives, David's brain pulls up a memory from his past with Katie. It's a little dusty, but he shakes it off. It's from that premarital counseling session where they sat down with Father Bill and he told them that life and marriage isn't all about happiness. He'd said something else, too, something that jarred them as young people focused on the possibilities ahead, focused on the promise of young love. If, God forbid, one of you were to die, would, Katie, wouldn't you want David to walk away from your marriage together thinking, gosh, the experience of marriage was so good, was so great, was so wonderful that I want to do it again. I can't wait to do it again. That, that memory, it moves something inside of David. Not that he needs to be married right away, but that he loved being married to Katie. He loved being a husband. That The two of them, they did it right. All the kids, all the weekends at the lake, all the hikes and the camping trips and the days she spent in her favorite chair, too sick to play with the kids, but too in love with them to not at least watch them play. They didn't get what they wanted, but they did the best with what they had. They were so good at it, at marriage, at love, that no matter how much it hurts right now, he would do it all again. We'll be right back. We're back, and David and his best friend Kyle have been on the road for five days, driving from Steubenville, Ohio, to David's hometown of Houston, Texas. The two of them have no set end date, no deadline for when to return. They're just going where the road takes them. So we stopped in Helen, Georgia, uh, to spend two nights with um, some old family friends of ours who we knew from Houston, actually knew Katie's family from Houston, and they moved out to Helen, Georgia to retire. Great folks. They have this beautiful cabin up in the hills. So they they take us over and it's this like picturesque, gorgeous, beautiful rolling hills winery um, with this, you know, incredible facilities. And it's just, I mean, just, it's the picturesque Napa winery, but mm -hmm. in the hills of Georgia, <laughs> which is like, where, where did this come from? And also, who knew this was here? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Cool. exactly. And the owner... Uh, it was just like this very open and welcoming and sort of that stereotypical restaurant owner who goes to every table and has the perfect story and has the whole family, you know, laughing like that's the guy. And I remember talking to him and, and, you know, he was, he was like, yeah, so, so they tell me that like you bought this, you bought this car and I'm, you know, sort of mock humbly. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's just this little, you know, V8 with, with 400 horsepower. And he's like, Oh, <laughs> that's cute. My Tesla has 600. <laughs> you you want to ride? I'm like, well, of course I want to ride. Yes. <laughs> um, and so Kyle and I, you know, climb into this thing and, and I mean, we're just, you know, just a few car nerds kind of, kind of talking and bantering. And it, it was, it was just one of those moments that you're like, how did this, how did this happen? <laughs> How did I get here? Everywhere David and Kyle stop, they have family. Not David's family, not Katie's family, but this extended network of people who knew Katie or David, who know about what happened, who might not know exactly the right thing to say or do, but still do something. Open their doors to him. Let him be. Let him exist. Let him rest and recharge and then get back on the road. It feels, as he tells me this story, that Katie is there, just lighting the path ahead of him. 
By now, it's been a week since he and Kyle got on the road. We're in Atlanta. We're hanging out with my cousins uh, and their families. And every night I had been FaceTiming with the kids. And, you know, they're having a great time with Nana and Papa. And they're seeing my folks. And, and of course, they miss me. But, like, they weren't, they didn't lack for anything. They were having a great time. And they were, you know, excited to see the the pictures that I would send home and stuff like that. But but there was something about that night. Um, and I think it was it was partly seeing my cousin with her husband and 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 their kids and then FaceTiming with my kids. I got choked up on the phone and said goodbye to them and I, I just, you know, I hung up the phone and I turned to Kyle immediately and I said, We're going home. It's it's time. It's time to go home back to Houston. David and Kyle go to bed early and wake up before dawn. Um, I think we were on the road by like six, maybe 630. Um, Because I was, you know, we did the math and it was like, well, if we do that, then we can get there by the time, you know, just before the kids go to bed. The two of them hit the road. They stop in New Orleans for a snack at Cafe Du Monde. They cross the state line to Texas. Driving home is one of my favorite things. No matter where you live, there are certain landmarks, they're different for everyone, that indicate that you're getting closer, that the trip is almost over. You know, you pass the Astrodome, and that's that's a moment in Houston. You, um, you pass the Houston Ship Channel. That's for sure a moment. For David, the moment of arrival, the moment he knows that he is home, is pulling into his driveway. His kids, his parents, Katie's parents all outside and waiting for him. Him rumbling up towards them in a loud, bright orange car. Pulling up to the garden that Katie had planned and project managed from the sofa in her final weeks, now lush and full of life. I pull into the front driveway and it's this gorgeous garden with, you know, beautiful grass and flowers and plants and these two huge oak trees and the kids are coming out in their PJs and, you know, big hugs for dad, but also, Hey, cool. This is this car. Let me literally climb through every nook and cranny of it, which I was all about. They were, you know, they, uh, they're big. The big thing they loved about that car is like, it didn't have the traditional, like the whole back seat folds down. It just had like this little like nook, right in the middle. Oh, yeah. And so that was yeah. like that was their secret passage, right? They're like close the trunk, yep. close the trunk. I want to climb through the secret passage into the <laughs> trunk. And I mean, they would just, you know, the open the sunroof and stand out the sun. I mean, and so I I've I've even got this picture where I I don't I don't remember who took it, but um but it's it's me talking with you know, her parents, I think we've got the hood open. So we're looking at the engine, maybe my parents, I forget. Um, and the kids are like just crawling all over the car and everyone's got smiles. And like, that's to me, that was the, that's, that's like the image that sticks with me about coming home is, you know, the, just, I, I think everybody that for me, it's an, it's an image of everybody having something new and 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 by 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 way of that new thing having hope not that you know uh, again I, I i'd like to think we're faithful people not that a new car is some panacea or some band-aid but there was something symbolic about the newness and you know the the fact that in in, and in a sense the frivolity of it right i mean it's not it's not like I went out and bought a um, a twelve passenger van, you know. Like that, there. <laughs> like I, I did something fun because it was fun in in a certain sense, and and that to have that as kind of one of the first building blocks of life after Katie, um, I you know, there was just something about that 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 sort of spoke to me. It's not the car that's new, it's all of it. Every day forth without Katie will be new. 
And once you have the time to process the pain, more and more of those happy memories return to you. You can't extract meaning from your pain right away. It does take time. And David's only been gone a week. He hasn't processed it all. It's not over, but he has enough space that he can be where he is. He can be the grieving husband and the grieving dad. He can live into what is new and what is now. And he does. When we speak, David is married again. His wife is named Teresa. They're going to have a baby, which will bring that total kid count to five, which is too many for that orange muscle car. So he's got to think about getting, I would say, an extended van would be my recommendation. Point is, Katie will always be a part of him. That road trip will always be a part of him, not because it brought him a cool, fancy car, but because it brought him back to his home, his life, himself. The David who came back home was calmer, more peaceful. Like Katie up at the cabin when David was insisting that their life was just too good to be true. It was good. And it was true. It still is. She was always encouraging me to just, just live, just, just be okay with with what we're with what we're doing right now and, and don't try to add something to it. Um, I feel like that's one of those lessons that I have tried to to make good on since she died that okay, now I see what you're I see what you were getting at for all those years. This has been terrible. Thanks for asking. I'm Nora McInerney. Our producer is Marcel Malikibu. Hannah Meacock-Ross is our project manager. Jordan Turgeon is our digital producer. Help on this episode from Jacob Maldonado-Medina and Phyllis Fletcher. Our theme music is by Joffrey Lamar Wilson, and we are a production of APM American Public Media.